Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Leaders Room with the ICLIF Leadership and Governance Center. My name is Rajiv, and I'm here today with David Gallus, uh, writer with the Sunday Business section of the New York Times, formerly with the Financial Times, covering M&As, and also author of the book, Mindful Work. David, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for having me. So uh, let's go back to the beginning. From uh, covering technology to covering M&A, um, uh, and all the things that you've been writing about, how did you get interested in mindful work and meditation? Well, my interest in mindfulness and meditation actually precedes my work as a business journalist. And some of my friends say, well, if you had enough self-awareness to be a meditator, why did you become a business journalist in the first place? <laughs> and it's a valid question. But as I found, you know, the two actually go hand in hand today. So my interest in meditation started when I was a college student. I was a philosophy major, I was studying religion, and uh, after studying many different traditions, I started academically reading about Buddhism. And the academic work on Buddhism was so compelling that I wanted to try it out. Uh, so I went and I sat my first meditation retreat. Uh, I was 19 years old. I sat and the practice of meditating was so profound um, that it touched me in a very deep way. So I began sitting Zen meditation, first in California and then in Boston where I was in school. And then I took my uh, junior year of college, my third year of university, to go to India. And I lived in a monastery. I studied with Zen masters, with Tibetan Rinpoches, and with a man named Munindraji, who was in fact a close friend of Gandhi's when he was still alive. And he taught me mindfulness meditation or insight meditation. And that then began uh, what is now a lifelong commitment to the practice. Hmm. So you did that when you were, how old you said? 20. 20. Came back, um, went back, to, uh, finished your education, and then uh, got into journalism. That's right. I, I tried a few different things. You finish school, you can bounce around for a few years. So I worked at a website. I designed museum exhibitions. But all the while, I was writing on the side. I was writing for newspapers and magazines, whoever would take me. But Rajiv, I wasn't very good. <laughs> so I finally went back to school. Uh, I went to the Graduate School of Journalism at UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. a two-year program, great, great school. Uh, and it was there that I really began um, to not only focus on business journalism, but understand how to excel in this profession, how to find and write really compelling and good stories. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my picture of, and I haven't been inside the offices of the New York Times, my picture of a, uh, of, of, of a newspaper office, particularly covering, covering business journalism, is noisy people, shouting, screaming, deadlines, uh, pressure, stress. And how does somebody like you, in that picture, I, I, can, I can see you in that picture, because that's what you do. Uh, and then I try to put a picture of meditation and mindfulness on it. Can I, uh, help me understand. Where, where do the two fit? Uh, well, f the newspaper newsroom today is actually one of the things that people are always struck by is how quiet it can seem. Uh, everyone's <laughs> typing. Yeah, well, that, you know yourself. The sound of keys, uh, uh, fingers on a keyboard isn't that loud. We're not we're working on selectric typewriters anymore. And, uh, but you still have deadlines. And, uh, we have deadlines. Yeah. There, there are definitely periods where it gets busy. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. towards the end of the day, when we're finally putting the paper together, it can get busy. And when a big story breaks, of course, it can be very exciting. There's no better place to be when news is breaking mm -hmm. than the newsroom of the New York Times. Uh, and yet, I have been able to manage um, the stress of being a business reporter. And there's no doubt about it. There's real stress. You know, whether it's publishing a story on a very tight deadline, you know, um, I remember when, for example, when 20th Century Fox made a bid for Time Warner. Everyone's all hands on deck. This is a big media story that's going to move markets, and we're writing very, very quickly. Um, or when it's a feature that I've worked on for weeks or even months, when it finally publishes, there's enormous stress just seeing that initial reaction, seeing how sources respond, seeing how social media lights up. These, there's no doubt about it. These are stressful situations. Mindfulness and meditation has helped me. Over the years, it has helped me remain calm, um, reduce my stress, not let what's happening around me define exactly what kind of experience I'm going to have that day. And so you're right. It's been this wonderful counterweight, a wonderful antidote, if you will, to the inherent stresses of being a journalist. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned it helps you stay calm. 
stay grounded and settled and all that. Is there any scientific basis? A lot of meditators uh, actually say that I, I feel calm. I feel, uh, you know, my stress is no more and this, that, and the other. Is that just talk or is there some scientific basis to it? We can now see in the minds of meditators that certain areas of the brain associated with stress reactions, for example, the amygdala, an almond-shaped region in the center of the brain, which uh, emits all our stress hormones whenever we have that fight-or-flight reaction, when our uh, chest gets tight and our heartbeat might start accelerating and it feels like the hair on the back of our neck is standing up. That's the stress hormones reacting. That's the amygdala firing up in a fight-or-flight situation. In the minds of meditators, the amygdala is actually less reactive. Those who have committed to a sustained meditation practice, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not going to happen if you just try meditation one time. But if you stick with it, if you internalize this practice, those people who actually have a sustained mindfulness practice have less reactive amygdalas. They have less volatile fight-or-flight reactions, and they're right there. You, you're hearing it. You're able to manage your stress reaction more effectively. You said you can see inside the brains of, um, uh, of people. Are you referring to any particular study? I, I personally can't see inside the brains of people, but uh, with technologies like fMRI technology and EEG technology, um, they have done multiple studies. Right. And uh, I, they, there's not just one study, of course, but uh, pioneers in the field of what's a wonderful name for this. It's called contemplative neuroscience. I just love that name yeah, as a field. Name, yeah. uh, but people like Richie Davidson yeah. and John Kabat-Zinn have done tremendous work um, scanning not only the minds of long-term secular meditators, but also comparing them to the minds of Tibetan monks, for example, who have meditated for tens of thousands of hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so there is plenty of scientific basis. It's not just uh, uh, people saying something. That, that's right. But, but I should hasten to add, what we are seeing there is that there seems to be some correlation. There seems to be some correlation that in the minds of meditators, there is perhaps a less reactive amygdala. It's important not to confuse the purpose of meditation with, say, having a less reactive amygdala. The purpose of meditation, of course, is to change our behavior, change uh, our interpersonal relationships, not necessarily to change uh, what hormones get released at a certain moment of, of time in a certain stress reaction. You don't want a very slow amygdala either. No, exactly. <laughs> there's, there's a reason we're trained to run when an alligator exactly, is right. chasing us. Exactly, yeah, yeah. All right, so what prompted you to, in the world of finance and technology and uh, I, I hear you. I, I understand you also cover executive compensation. So amongst all of this, what, what prompted you to write Mindful Work? Well, I had been working on a number of different stories at the Financial Times. I had been covering mergers and acquisitions. I had profiled the Facebook CEO, Mark Zuckerberg. I just had an exclusive jailhouse interview with Bernie Madoff, the Ponzi schemer. Mm -hmm. And I needed a good story. As a journalist, it's kind of the bread and butter. If, if I'm not working on a good story, I'm going to be a little antsy. And at the same time, I had been meditating. It was still a big part of my life, but I had never considered it might be part of my professional life. It was something very personal. It was not something even most people in the office knew about. And yet I was looking for another story, and I came across an initial headline. I think it was the Associated Press, a very brief wire story that said in a big company in Minnetonka, Minnesota, in the middle of the United States of America, a company was practicing meditation in the office. And they, you know, a, a light bulb went off in my head. I said, there's probably nobody better qualified to write this story than me. I mean, I'm a long-term meditator and I'm a business journalist. I gotta go check this out. So I got on a plane almost the next day, flew out there, and the company was General Mills. Big company. Uh, their products are all over the world. Com uh, products like uh, Cheerios and haagen ice cream, and the list goes on. Mm -hmm. Uh, and here they were with a meditation room in every building on the corporate campus and a meditation and mindfulness program that has now engrossed hundreds of the most senior leaders at the company. And what did they find? Well, those leaders were becoming less stressed. They were reporting that they were, have a bedding, they were having better relationships with their reports. And altogether, it had had a tremendously beneficial uh, impact not only on the company as a whole but really specifically on the individuals who had practiced it 
And I, I always try to bring it back to, to the individual level. You know, mindfulness is not something a company does. Mindfulness is something that uh, individuals who happen to work at companies can practice. We say the same thing about leadership, by the way. That at the end of the day, you have to bring it down to what individuals within the company does. Right. It's not what the company does as a whole. That's right. Yeah. So, so it all began with, uh, with, with, with General Mills. So you went out there, you, you found meditation rooms, and you found mm -hmm. that they were spending time and money in sort of training their employees or, or, or uh, encouraging their employees to meditate. Uh, absolutely, a very robust homegrown program. And I used that as the basis for uh, an article that ran in the Financial Times weekend, FT, FT weekend, uh, called The Mind Business. Mm -hmm. And it was a first look, you know, how some big US companies were bringing mindfulness and meditation into the workplace. Uh, that was the jumping off point. Uh, immediately there were questions. Where could people find out more? What other companies were doing this? How could they also bring mindfulness and meditation to their workplace? And I had none of the answers. Uh, so I endeavored to find out. And I w essentially went on a journey into the contemplative heart of corporate America. So tell us a few more companies that uh, you found and met that are doing some good work in this area. Absolutely. Well, I mentioned Facebook earlier. When I profiled Mark Zuckerberg, it was about kind of the core social networking business that he was running. Little did I know that a few years later, his engineers were doing compassion research days, working with Buddhist uh, scientists to try to cultivate compassion at the workplace and use that to inform new algorithms, new policies at the social network to make interactions between users on the platform more harmonious. I then went even to Goldman Sachs, of all companies, where they were teaching their traders, their investment bankers, to meditate in an effort just to get them to be less stressed out. It's high pressure. So they weren't necessarily trying to change the product that Goldman Sachs offers, like Facebook was. They were just saying, if this is a bit of stress relief for you individually, well, that's a good thing. And my, com my, my travels took me around the country, up to Vermont, where Green Mountain Coffee Roasters had developed a mindful stretching and yoga program for their thousands of blue collar workers who work in factories and drive their trucks. Uh, all the way back down to Southern California where a, a company like Patagonia, uh, founded by Yvonne Chouinard, uh, a lifelong Zen Buddhist, still tried to embody that ethos of trying to be a responsible apparable company from everything they did, from where they sourced their cotton to how they uh, thought about the afterlife of their products. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that became the, the compilation, if you will. Yeah. yeah. So that I spent several years going around, reporting on the book. And then the book, Mindful Work, How Meditation is Changing Business from the Inside Out, it was released uh, la last year. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I, I have read it. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's fascinating to me, though. Um, I, I, I often tell audiences in Asia that, look, this is something we invented in this part of the world 5,000 years ago. But we've completely forgotten it. And it's become almost like a movement. Uh, in, in the West, particularly the U.S. Uh, so related to that, um, is it getting, becoming too much of a movement? Is it becoming too commoditized? Are there now gimmicks uh, that are being offered uh, in the name of meditation? Are you concerned about that at all? Uh, there's a whole term for y what you just described, which, which is? is this concern that uh, mindfulness is somehow being co-opted, corrupted by capitalism. And it's called mick mindfulness. <laughs> I love that. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and it embodies this notion that something that was, of course, uh, inspired from a very noble tradition, this is essentially the foundational elements of mindfulness are, no doubt about it, drawn from Southeast Asian Buddhism. They've been adapted for a secular audience largely over the last 40 years as mindfulness has become more mainstream mm -hmm. in the United States. And now they are actually being uh, d you know, divorced from any re religiosity mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. spiritual traditions at all. Mindfulness as it's being offered in the workplace is purely secular. Yes. It has nothing to do with Buddhism. And there's a concern um, by some among uh, very traditional, you know, kind of traditionalist Buddhist scholars. And on the other hand, by social conservatives who actually feel like maybe this is religion in disguise. Mm -hmm. And th there are valid concerns there. W in the course of my reporting, I saw some very successful interventions, and I also saw less successful interventions, mm -hmm. where it did, seem, it did seem superficial. Mm -hmm. It did seem to be um, not necessarily promoting r 
sustainable behavioral change that would make people suffer less and be kind to one another. Mm -hmm. And yet, on balance, I found that the vast majority of people I spoke with and the vast majority of teachers working in this area were doing it with really noble intentions. Mm -hmm. And that the baseline result was, at, at the very minimum, a little bit of stress reduction and a little bit of uh, more kindness and mm -hmm. compassion in the workplace. And I think that alone is a good thing. It's hard to argue with less stress mm -hmm. and more kindness in the workplace, especially if some of the other gains happen to be uh, enhanced productivity, better um, health and wellness, uh, fewer sick days, which ultimately can translate into productivity gains. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a complete believer. Uh, and my question is more about, you know, are you concerned about the, what you call the muck mindfulness? So, you know, here, these five minutes will change your life. And, and are there people who are getting into the so-called teaching of mindfulness meditation who are not as steeped into it and therefore sort of uh, McDonaldizing it, if you will? Uh, that's what I was... Uh, sure. Well, I, I, am I concerned about it? Um, I think it's important to watch out for. Uh, I have yet to see really damaging interventions. Okay. So uh, I, am I concerned about it? Sure, but th there's lots of things to be concerned about in the world. Uh, this isn't too high up the list. Okay. We do, however, and you're right to focus on this, uh, face a supply and demand imbalance. The appetite for mindfulness teachings greatly outstrips and the... And that's the point I'm... Uh, the, the, yeah, the number yeah. of qualified teachers who and are out there. Does that, does that have an impact on quality? Um, it, so, I think it, it may, uh, I think it may, mm -hmm. and yet, I have yet to see, and I, I try to stay, stay abreast of what's going on and what's on the marketplace, I have yet to see any really damaging teachings. And I think that's an important distinction to make. There's a difference between a less qualified teacher and a, a teacher who's really inflicting harm or um, populating uh, nefarious or bad ideas in the workplace under the name of mindfulness. And that's just something I just haven't seen. Mm -hmm. I, I'm attuned to it, and I think if I were to see it, I would be uh, most disturbed, but I haven't seen it yet. See, uh, neither have neither I, uh, and that's the good news, but I, I, I can't but help remember a story. When I was working in New York uh, on Wall Street, I joined a, a, a yoga class, and uh, you know, it was one of those hot yoga uh, studios that was yep. all over the place. And there was this young Turk who was like, you know, like Captain America, you know, pushing, come on, you can do it, come on, you can do it, and pushing, pushing, pushing people. And there were people who were, you know, and, and the class I joined had 40 or 50 people in the big studio. Yeah. I was new, totally inflexible, unfit. Yeah. And there were people who'd been doing it for a long time, and everybody was being treated the same way. And the, 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 the come on, you can do it, like a military. Uh, that disturbed me a lot. I think these, those, that could cause a lot of damage because you, yoga is not about, you know, pushing you to the limit on day one. Not at all. So that's where I'm coming from, you know, because I saw that firsthand and I said, ah, this is not okay. And, and, and that, that doesn't sound like a mindfulness teacher to me. No, certainly not, right? Yeah. So that's why I was uh, asking the question. But I'm glad, you, you know, somebody who's keeping abreast with all this, you, you haven't come across too many damaging uh, kind of uh, situations. But uh, anyway, I nevertheless love the term <laughs> that you used. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, companies are now investing more and more in this, and uh, what do you think is the level of skepticism, if any? It, among employees, there is uh, deep skepticism at some companies. Mm -hmm. There's a real willingness to engage with these ideas at other companies. Mm -hmm. And I, when I talk about my book and talk about this new and emerging field, I don't say that every company should be teaching mindfulness and meditation. Uh -huh. I, I don't recommend that every employee uh -huh. uh, try this out. I'm very attuned to the fact that this is sensitive material. This is very personal material. It may or may not be something that an individual or uh, an organization's culture is, is in the right space for. And so uh, it's incredibly important to recognize that. This is not something that is uh, absolutely for everyone. I say if you as an individual are ready for it and if your company has a culture where this would be appropriate and would be well received, then by all means try it because uh, as we've seen, and there are lots of studies now, it can have beneficial effects. But this is no panacea 
and it's not necessarily something that's going to be a good fit at every company or every organization. Every individual. You've got to be kind right. of ready for it. That's too. right. Yeah, yeah. Let me uh, ask you an unrelated question, uh, going back to uh, your background. You interviewed Bernie Madoff, you said, uh, in prison. Tell us what, a little bit about that. What did you learn, and what can we learn? Uh, how did he do, why did he do what he did? Why did those values go so wrong? Yeah. And what can we learn from that? I, I wish I knew why he did what he did. The, the closest I can come is to say that um, I, I don't believe that he set out with the intent. When he made the, the first bad decision he made, which he did decades ago, of course, I don't believe he did it with the intent of going as far as he did. It was one of these situations where a small series of, of lies and misdeeds uh, snowballed into a real uh, terrible catastrophe that ruined the lives of many, many people. Um, and so it was, it w one of the things that was so disturbing was the banality uh, of, of this, this man's, um, I, th I don't know that evil is the right word, I, because again, I, don't, I didn't sense malice. It was more of an indifference. He didn't seem attuned to the suffering that he had inflicted. And uh, that's actually the very definition of a sociopath. Mm -hmm. It's someone who, who actually can't feel empathy, mm -hmm. someone who wasn't able to recognize that he had ruined lives, that he had caused so, he so much suffering. He wasn't repentful. He was not repentful. Hmm. And, uh, and you believe he didn't start off with that intention, but somehow got sucked into it after doing one thing and then the other. Yeah. And what do you think, uh, what can we all learn from that? As we I, all look at our careers. And I, I think it's, it's a great question, and I think the answer is, is enormously simple. It, we have to hold ourselves to the highest standards at every single moment. The smallest little decision can snowball and become a, an absolute mess. And w without the vigilance, without being mindful, every step of the way, it's all too easy to make steps that could have really dire consequences down the road. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that makes sense. Well, thank you so much. One last question. For somebody that is somewhat getting interested in exploring this whole meditation uh, field, What's your advice for beginners? Uh, I think try it. See if you can uh, establish a daily practice, even a few minutes a day, five minutes a day. Uh, I don't have five minutes a day. We all have five minutes a day. Uh, see if you can make the time to be present, in the present moment, aware of your body, aware of your breath, if your mind wanders, bring your attention back to the present moment, back to the body or the breath, and just see what it feels like to, to be here, right here, right now, without being lost in thought. If you can do that for a few minutes a day, that's a great first step. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and uh, is there a period of time that one should stick with it before giving up, or is, or is it different for different people? Or? Try 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> 10 weeks, yeah. in all seriousness. Mm -hmm. it, it really isn't something that happens overnight. In, in the same way that we don't go to the gym and expect to have uh, washboard abs and mm -hmm. big muscles the next day, uh, we know that it takes, it takes weeks, it takes months, mm -hmm. it can take years. Mm -hmm. The same is true when we're building the muscles of our mind. Mm -hmm. Very good. David, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed talking to David. Uh, lots and lots of lessons to take away. And uh, the one that will stay with me, one of the many that will stay with me is, uh, you know, A, mindfulness meditation is not for everyone, but B, almost everybody should try it. And if you do decide to try it, uh, stick with it for at least eight to ten weeks before you see uh, what it's doing for you or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.